This week, we continue our series on the Beatitudes with an examination of mercy. Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, but just what is the root of mercy? How does mercy relate to forgiveness? Do you struggle with extending mercy to others? What is the connection between mercy and judgment? Let's join Pastor Lance to explore answers to these questions. As you can see, you probably have surmised by now, uh, Pastor Seth is out of town today. And so uh, this is sort of something like my week went about uh, two weeks ago. All right. Man, I can't believe what a lame drive it was in today. My morning has not gone on all as planned. Let me just check my email for a minute here. Delete. Delete. Dear Lance, Delete. I'm going to be out of town Sunday, May 25th, to attend Natalie Hall's wedding. Will you please cover the message for me? It's the fifth beatitude, and it's about mercy. I have included a few notes for you to give you a general direction. Thanks so much, and have fun. Have fun. Mercy. Hmm. Mercy. That shouldn't be too hard. I'm a pretty merciful person. Let me see. Mercy. That's that thing about not getting what we do deserve. Not having a critical spirit. Wait. Not having a critical spirit? Yikes. I'm not so sure about this. What about that telemarketing guy that called during dinner? And I politely said no, and he kept talking and talking and talking. And then I firmly said no, and I, I know he was just doing his job, but by the end of the call, my dinner was starting to get cold, and I was really getting to the point where I wanted to tell him what he could do with his solar panels. Or, or what about when the Mormons came to the door, right when I'm just sitting down to watch Star Trek? Actually, that one is kind of fun. But... Are my motives about sharing God's truth with them or just about trying to talk circles around them to make myself look spiritual? Or, or what about that guy who cut me off when I was just driving over to work now? He made that little wave that says, yep, I cut you off, but I'm accelerating, so that makes it okay, ha-ha. <laughs> or all those annoying emails I got from vendors trying to get me to spend money that we don't need to spend. Or when they walk into my office at church and say, hi, I just need two to three minutes of your time, and then stay 15 or 20 minutes trying to sell me stuff. Man, that makes me want to break into tongues just to scare them away. <sighs> I'm not so sure I'm very good at this mercy thing after all. Why did Seth want me to do this one? Everyone at church knows me. They know that I'm not really a very merciful person. That's Seth. I bet he called Natalie Hall and asked her to schedule her wedding on the fifth beatitude so I'd have to preach it. Then God would do that cosmic joke thing and make me learn mercy all week long at 100 times the normal rate people usually have to learn stuff. Oh, Lord. I'm not really sure about this mercy thing. You're going to have to do something kind of radical in me this week if we're going to pull this thing off. But, Lord, please have mercy. We're going to be continuing on uh, in our series in Matthew 5, the Beatitudes. This is week five. Have you sensed a theme? We started with blessed are the poor in spirit, uh, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the meek. All three of those seem to be a lot about getting me out of the equation. Did you enjoy that? Because I didn't. I found it just a little bit irritating. I found it to be true, but a little bit of a bother because I really like me being the creation. I'm one of my favorite people. I'm with myself most days. Occasionally, I'm not with me. You should stay away from me on those days. I'm a little bit crazy. The fourth one, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, who are driven to God for interchange because we need to be caught up in others more than ourself. See, it just keeps coming. we got to get ourselves out of the way. 
If we were to hunger and thirst for righteousness, what would that mean? We need it like a drink of water, that it would satisfy something in our souls. So we're going to be continuing on. Today's Matthew chapter 5, verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Now that is the relief right there. That's what we need. So we're going to pull out our, uh, our time-honored definitions of grace and mercy, and we're going to start there this morning, right? Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what you, and that thing that you deserve is probably not like a hot fudge Sunday. okay? <laughs> it's probably more like the consequences that we deserve, right? Here's the problem for me for mercy, is that when we're, when we're talking about mercy, we weigh it against judgment, against critical, having a critical spirit. But my, my problem is that I have spent my entire adult life honing my finely tuned uh, system of judgment and critical spirit. I mean, I've got this thing really, I have a black belt in critical spirit. Um, and it's not really something that I'm proud of, but it's something that I've kind of had with me my whole life. And, um, you know, Seth tells stories about sarcasm being an art form in his family. I think sort of in my college years, I thought that argument was an art form. And, b- you boy, if you could out-argue somebody, if you could really, you know, pin them to the mat and kind of do that kind of number, uh, you really showed how superior you were. And so... I mean, I guess as I grew older and really realized that you shouldn't do that in the workforce uh, to people that you're working with, especially your boss, that never happened, by the way, I thought about it a lot, <laughs> but there's, there's some things um, that I definitely did along the way that I have sort of carried around with me as regrets because of the way that I treated people because of things that I have said and done. I want to tell you some things about mercy. We wrote, really don't have any capacity to do it on our own. And that's where we're going to begin today. Take out your outlines if you haven't already. The quality of mercy is rooted in God, not man. And I'm going to prove that to you. But there is something that's cool. When we experience God's mercy and we extend it again to other people, we really do sort of taste a spark of the divine. There is something amazing about offering mercy to people, but that doesn't mean that it's necessarily easy. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, it says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us, in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. See, He is the Father of mercies. All mercy comes from Him. It's almost as if we're born with this tank that's got the label mercy on it, but it's born empty. And as He pours mercy into that tank, we have the capacity to pour mercy into other people. But it's not really just a suggestion. It's really more, they're, they're, they're more rules than guidelines. Okay? Uh, Luke chapter 6 says, Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. I want to come back to that. I want to set aside the do not judge thing for a minute because I think that's important to spend some time on. But I want to talk, be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Here's the tricky part for us is that God is the standard for the mercy that we are supposed to show because um, there's not very many of God's attributes that I have a tendency to just naturally Uh, show in my life, Uh, and mercy is definitely among them, but it seems to me that there is a relationship 
between the mercy that we receive from God and the mercy that we show other people. So we're going to explore that a little bit this morning. Mercy is part of our journey to forgiveness. You may have noticed this, but in my life, I am sort of event-focused. I have a calendar. It's on my iPhone. I kind of live according to my calendar. That means in my head, a lot of times I'm going from event to event as if that was the main stuff. I'm going to the next event. I have a meeting. Uh, I have major events in my life, like getting a promotion or getting married or having children. I move from event to event. But God seems to me to be less interested in the events of my life and more interested in the journey that gets me to each of those events. And it's in the journey that he seems to want to teach me things. Easy journey, there's there's just not as many lessons that I can tell other than maybe I did something okay, maybe I did something right, doesn't necessarily mean I did something right. Difficult journey, maybe there's some lessons in there for me. Maybe I took a path that wasn't the right path and he was trying to push me back onto a better path. We're going to talk about Peter for a minute. I love Peter. Matthew 18. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times. You know what's funny about Peter? I I relate to Peter. You know why I relate to Peter? He's sort of a a driver personality. He's sort of a leap before he looks kind of guy. We actually did this whole play, Malchus Affair, five years ago. We did this whole play about a servant of Caiaphas, the high priest named Malchus, that Peter came up and cut his ear off. Very Christian thing for him to do. But he was a threat. And I kind of of resonate with Peter a little bit because I kind of just think that he he was trying to manage and organize. He's trying to manage Jesus so he wouldn't, like, do things to harm himself. He was trying to sneak around and kind of orchestrate things so that Jesus would have the best possible chance of being the Messiah, (laughs) as if he had anything to do with that whatsoever. So I like Peter. And here's the funny thing about Peter. Peter actually already knew what the law said about how many times he was supposed to forgive people. You know, I meant to look this up, but it's something like you're supposed to forgive somebody three times. Then you can have them strung strung up by their thumbs and punished or whatever. So, so here's Peter, he comes to Jesus, and he wants to be noble, right? He comes to Jesus, and he's thinking, Jesus is a, is a really forgiving guy, so I'm going to come up, and I'm going to raise the bar. Hey, Lord, if I want to be really spiritual, should I forgive this guy not three times, but seven times? <laughs> seven times. I'm pretty spiritual. And Jesus is all Peter, Peter, Peter. You just don't get it, do you? If you had really forgiven the guy, you wouldn't even remember that he sinned against you in the first place. I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. Some verses translate it 70 times seven. It doesn't matter whether it's 77 or 490. It doesn't matter. It's supposed to be an infinite number of times. You're just supposed to keep forgiving him. Forever? Yes. What am I going to do with that? I just don't even have a, you know, I mean, there are people that really irritate me. They really irk me. I, I have trouble forgiving them once. That, my friend, is what mercy is all about. So, Jesus has mercy on Peter, and he tells a story, which we'll pick up in verse 23. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. You could read that as like $10 million. We don't know exactly what it was, but the idea is that it was so a debt that was so large, that it was overwhelming, that he would take multiple lifetimes to pay off this debt. 
which kind of raises the question, what was he doing all the way back then? You know, is he betting on the camel races? I don't know, you know. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. That was the way they did it. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But, and you would think, that's a nice ending to the story, isn't it? But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, a couple of days' wages, $2,000 tops. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in, you wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Ouch, again. It's a great story. Until you put yourself in the guy's position who was forgiven much, but who didn't want to forgive his buddy. Because then, it requires you to really think about the way that you act toward other people. It requires you to consider, am I really that guy? Because it sounds kind of bad. I want to go back to what I think is one of the key verses, verse 27. There's three things that happen in this verse, and they're all super important. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. The first thing he did, he took pity on him. That my friends, is empathy. Walking a mile in the other guy's shoes, putting yourself in their place. There are people in my life that I didn't want to put myself in their place. I kind of think they kind of made their bed. But sometimes there are just things in life that we can't control. So what if I was forced into that place? Well, all right, if I was really in that place, maybe I would have a little bit more empathy. The second thing that had, that happened, was he canceled the debt. That was something that he did deserve, but it was canceled. It was taken away. It was eradicated. It was turned into nothing. It was mercy. And then the last thing that happened is he let him go. He forgave him. He's gone. Free to live his life. Free to move on to whatever it is that God has next for him. That's kind of our journey to forgiveness. And mercy is a critical in part. Because until we have mercy there is something that really blocks that natural flow from empathy to mercy to forgiveness. You see, as sinners by nature, we all have great capacity to do damage not to other people. Well, not just to other people. We certainly have the capacity to do that. But we have the capacity to do great damage to ourselves by withholding the mercy and forgiveness that we owe other people. 
You realize that's damaging to yourself? See, here's the thing, and this is the next fill-in, so flip your sheet over. We only experience mercy to the extent that we grant mercy to others. You remember that tank, your mercy tank? There's a valve on the entry to that tank. And that valve lets mercy into the tank, and it's what lets mercy out of the tank. And when we close that valve because we don't want to offer people mercy, then we're closing the valve through which we receive God's mercy. That flow goes both ways. God gave us an illustration of this in the Lord's Prayer itself. Nothing less than the Lord's Prayer, Matthew chapter 6. He says, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Now see, there's this, there's this relationship that can't be severed between the forgiveness that we receive from God and the forgiveness that we give others, the mercy that we receive from God and the mercy that we give others. Going on in Matthew chapter 6, he's, Jesus says, For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Now, I don't know about you, but I found this to be a little bit of a troubling verse. Because it kind of sounds like God is holding something over our heads. That if we have a critical spirit, if we have a hard heart, God is either not willing or not able to forgive us. Well, you could read it that way, but I believe you would be mistaken in your interpretation. Because that's not consistent with what we know of God's character in Scripture, is it? Thank goodness. Ephesians 2 says, Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, he has more mercy than he knows what to do with. He has plenty of mercy in his tank. His tank is the whole universe of all mercy that there is. God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. So here we have that God was willing to extend to us mercy even while we were dead. That means we did not have to earn mercy by giving mercy. What does it mean then? That what is this relationship between God's mercy and our mercy, God's forgiveness and our forgiveness? I'm going to go to one of the great Protestant preachers of all time that I'd never heard of before this week (laughs) that Seth introduced to me, Dr. D. Martin Lloyd-Jones. And he said, We proclaim whether we have received forgiveness or not by whether we forgive or not. Do you see that? That's important. We proclaim whether we have received forgiveness or not by whether we forgive or not. If I am forgiven, then I shall forgive. None of us has by nature a forgiving spirit. If you now have such a spirit, if you have it for one reason only, you have seen what God has done for you, in spite of what you deserve, you say, I know that I am truly forgiven, therefore, I truly forgive. So that's kind of the thing. He had to do it first because we don't even have the capacity to do it ourselves. But I'll tell you this, and this is important, a critical spirit blocks us from giving and receiving mercy. I promised I would come back to this, so I want to take just a moment. Matthew chapter 7 begins with this, do not judge or you too will be judged, for in the same way you judge others, you will be judged 
and with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Now, kind of when I was growing up, I grew up in the church, and I had lots of friends that came with me to church. Uh, some of them were Christians, some of them were not Christians, some of them you just wanted time to hang out after church together, so that was kind of the deal. You want to hang out with these friends after church, bring them to church, and then you know you'll get to hang out with them. Most of them were okay with that most of the time, uh, so that's what we did. If my friends knew one verse in the Bible, it was John 3.16, for God so loved the world. However, something seems to have happened over the last 20 or 30 years. Now, if my non-Christian friends know one verse in the Bible, it's Matthew 7.1. It's, and usually in the King James. I think that's in the Atheist Handbook. <laughs> Judge not, lest you be judged. There is a wonderful irony in this verse. It's, it's, honestly, it's just a little bit sad. But it's a little bit wonderful, too. The irony is this. The same critical spirit, because if we're honest with ourselves, don't we think that, too? Don't you judge me. I don't like it. I don't like it when you judge me. Only God will be my judge. Yeah, he will. But the same critical spirit within us that cries out, don't you judge me, cannot see that in that moment they are judging someone. They are judging that, we, they, that somebody else doesn't have the right to judge me. Is that true? Certainly among believers, there is a Bible full of evidence to tell us that we are supposed to help one another out when we stumble. That the correction of a friend is trustworthy and valuable. Clearly, we are supposed to take the log out of our own eye first, but then... We have the ability to take the log, or the speck, the moat, out of somebody else's eye. Romans 14 says, You then, why do you judge your brother, or why do you look down on your brother? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess to God. So then, each of us will give an accounting of himself to God. Mercy's tough. I was trying to think of a really good personal example to show how someone's been merciful to me. And the truth is, I was just completely overwhelmed uh, because a lot of people have shown me incredible amounts of mercy far beyond uh, what I've ever deserved. I, I picked one, but it really is no better than any other. Uh, very early on, before I was full-time at the church, before I had been to seminary, I was just the music guy. I just came up, and I liked to sing. And I came up to Seth, real heavy-hearted. I said, Seth, I, I don't even know how to begin to tell you this. I think you're going to need to find a new music guy. I have had a struggle with pornography, and... And I just don't think that you want that guy uh, leading music at your church. And he looked down, and he considered that for a moment. He said, Lance, if we didn't have any men serving in the church who struggled with pornography, we wouldn't have any men serving in the church. <laughs> now... That was a statement of mercy, because not every man struggles with pornography. However, every man struggles. Every woman struggles. We are all sinners saved by grace, and it is because of God's mercy that we can do anything at all worthy of the calling that we've received from God. But I will tell you this about mercy. It is difficult. 
but you must figure it out because that valve needs to be open in front of your mercy tank. You must open that valve to offer mercy to other people because it is only then that you will receive the full blessing of God's mercy back in your own life. We could ask the question that if we feel unforgiving towards other people, what does that say about are we really see, receiving God's forgiveness? Because if, if we are unable, if we are blocked from, from giving mercy and forgiveness to people, we should question whether our valve is open the way that it should be. I'll give this to you one more time. Empathy and mercy and forgiveness. Let's pray together. Oh God, it is completely true that we fall short of, of your best for us every day. It is completely true that we have an extremely limited ability to extend mercy toward other people. But it is our desire to understand the nature of these things. It is our desire to allow you to change us. But mercy is so hard, you're gonna, we just need your help. Your mercy is an endless, bottomless tank. And you are so willing to give it to us right now. So Father, it is our earnest request this morning and help us in this earnestness because it causes us to have to face a part of ourselves that we don't always want to face. It causes us to have to die to ourselves a little bit, something that we are so committed to not doing uh, because it's painful and we want to avoid pain in our lives. Father, I just pray that you would help us this week to extend mercy to people in our lives who may not deserve it, that you would give us eyes to see them the way that you see them and a desire to put ourselves in their shoes a little bit. And Father, we need your help for this all week this week. Please be with us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. We invite you to come worship with us every Sunday at 9.30 in Irvine, California. And you can visit our website at pacificchurch.com to learn more about upcoming sermon series and our church family.